Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Steve Cypress again, who's a successful entrepreneur, top direct response marketer, who has built nearly a dozen successful companies including simulated sports services, winner's circle promotions, and many more. He prefers the vicarious thrill of coaching many businesses. Last time, he was too good, so I had to bring him back. He shared direct response strategies used building his company simulated sports services, the wow strategy, which helps businesses increase sales and marketing. Steve, thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here. I promise I won't be as good this time, so you won't have to bring me back. <laughs> we'll keep bringing you back and back. But, you know, you were talking about simulated sports services. You have a long, decorated career, and I could not stop there. So I had to bring you back, and you talked about the WOW strategy, simulated sports services. So after simulated sports ter- services, you went to law school, then simulated sports services. What was next? After that, uh, next was I uh, messed up that whole company, and uh, you know, lost everything and went down to nothing, and actually uh, was homeless for a little bit of time. Really? Uh, yeah. And oh so God. I, you know, just kind of lost it all. And so I, uh, well, I, that probably can relate to a lot of entrepreneurs out there. We have our ups and downs. Yeah. You know, we're not looking to. We 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 have our freedom, which is freedom to succeed, freedom to fail. And I wouldn't trade that for a nine to five. You know, I'll get a watch when I retire in fifty years and always be miserable. You know, I'll just be sometimes in a downslope and sometimes in an upslope, but uh, that's the life that we choose as an entrepreneur. So sure, I messed that one up, and actually what I did was I answered an ad in the paper. So one thing I did is I started up that company again with a different name. They're going to start all over again with the list that I had and the software that I had. I just didn't have my my name and my customers that, uh, even though I knew who they were, they didn't know that I didn't put my my face out on this company. I didn't put my name out on it, so they didn't know who I was, and they didn't know that they were my loyal customers. So I pretty much started all over, except I had my list. I mm-hmm. knew people that were interested in that kind of game and that kind of service. Mm-hmm. So, and this time I started it the way that I would have preferred it to be, instead of the way I had built it. So I don't know if we spoke last time, but I built this thing. I and this is the fantasy app. sport. This is the fantasy sport. Yeah, it's a fantasy sports game company. So basically, it's a service that's provided that uh, t- the timing is in line with professional sports leagues. And I'm in the United States, so there's like football season in the fall, and baseball in the mm-hmm. spring, and basketball and hockey in the winter, yeah. and then there's golf and whatever else. So uh, you know, it, it, the money comes in all, all right before a season, right. and then you have to spend that money and, and, and pay the employees and do everything throughout the season to support the game. But uh, the way I built it was based on how I went through college. And back in my college and law school days, I was always bored out of my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, I didn't have you know great advice to say, don't go to school. Uh, like many people today, uh, kids are not getting that great advice either. They're getting the advice, go to college, mm-hmm. get a degree, which is, in most cases, as we all know, m- basically meaningless yeah. and they're back on their parents couch and they're way in debt and and they're angry and they're sleeping in on Wall Street and and saying why don't I get a job and like it's because you're you're taking the wrong path I, to me I was looking for I don't know what kids are today but I was looking for a shortcut yeah what I made you go to law school be a shortcut and law or law school whatever is going to yeah. be a shortcut to getting me you know oh you'll make more money just by having this piece of paper that's a shortcut mentality yeah and uh it's never the right way to get started if you ask me so but how however while i was going through school i was bored out of my mind during the whole semester until finals week so finals week was when i finally would crack a book and finally would start to you know write a 25 page paper in like three days And, like, this was exciting to work on a deadline and get everything done. You know, who knew I was, like, an entrepreneur even back then because that's how we are. We're going to wait until something has to be done and get it done. So that was that that got the adrenaline going. It got the rush going. And when I started my business, I said, that's what I loved most about schools. Those last two weeks of each semester, you can take the other 11 and, you know, you know, that's when we get into all kinds of trouble or we're going to the football games or hanging around or partying or whatever kids do in college until crunch time where we go crazy. Right. Well, I set up my whole business that way. So I had helped me to burn out on the business because I was constantly, every week was like a finals week. I had to get out all the newsletters and had to do this. And then there was a second sport and an overlap and a third. And so when I crashed that whole thing to the ground and I started over, I said, this is what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to do just football only. Hmm. So this was a revelation. This was fantastic for me. I did football only, which means the the game, the, the money is coming into the game during preseason, which is in August in America here for American football. And then the season goes on September, October, November, and December, and then playoffs, and it's over. Well, right away in January again, I have to start figuring out the ads I'm going to play. Some of these publications are like once a year annual publication, and their lead time for an ad is like six months in advance, and wow. the thing's coming out in July. Right. So I had to get the ads in in January. Well, now I could do that because I wasn't also running basketball and hockey, and I wasn't ramping up right. for baseball. I was doing just football. So I could really concentrate. And football, the most popular sport, and also the easiest one to administrate because it's one game a week. Right. Whereas basketball, hockey, baseball. Baseball's got to be a nightmare. Yeah. It's craziness. So uh, I was like, look, during the season, it's one game a week. I can spend the rest of the time really serving people and talking to them and, and, and getting things going. And, and then the off season, first of all, lo and behold, when the season ended in December, I might even get a week off. I might get a couple of week break before I ramp back up again in January and get my ads in. And then I have a few more weeks in February or so. And then Maybe in March and April I can start to get ready for the year and make sure everything is done. And then we're really gearing up in June, July, and August we're launching and we're going to the season. So I redesigned the company. The, the beauty of, of, of crashing and burning is my Phoenix Rising was a redesigned company with football only. Right. Here's the issue, though. In the first season, I didn't have money, of course, to, to advertise, so I could only market to my list. And I got way less people into my game that I was used to having, not to mention I was used to having all the sports and lots of cash flow. So right. I had an off season and pretty much when the season ended, I needed to get a job. I could not make it through paying the rent and, and whatever I was doing from you know January till July or August when I had to really get started again. I opened a paper and I looked for a job to take for a few months. Right. And uh, Lo and behold, I found that I still could not think like a nine to five job person. I was only attracted to entrepreneurial type of jobs, commission only, opportunity to rise. Like I was, I, I was only attracted to those kind of opportunities. I couldn't even take a normal job. Not that it, it would have been fair to the employer anyway, since I planned to leave in the fall. So right. what happened was the ad I answered was for a door to door sales company. And it said, we're opening new locations in the area, and we're training for management, but you'll do all areas of the business. So you'll start out doing actual sales in the field, and you'll stock the warehouse with the items, and you'll do the ordering, and you'll do the interviews, and the banking, and we're going to teach you the whole thing, and then we're going to give you the keys to a location. Nice. And I said, yeah, yeah, well, that's good, but the, you know, because that, that excited me. I'm like, that's great, but I have my business. But at least this is more exciting than just you're going to do a nine-to-five thing. You're right. going to do lots of different things. It's helping to run a business. I just ran a business. And I was, when I went in for the interview, I was like, for real? Uh, because based on my recent experience, I had collapsed a multi-million dollar business. And this was, by the way, in the late 80s, for those of you that, that don't know, I'm dating myself to back then, was the Carter Recession, as it's now known. And interest rates were like at 21%. Banks were not lending money to anybody. And so who was going to put me, give me the keys and, and let me run a business. And I went in for this interview and they said, wow, what a great background you have. You ran your own business. Now we'll teach you this one. We'll put you in a business. I'm like, really? With the worst credit report, I just, I just crashed the whole business and I, I'm, I'm, I'm down to nothing and I'm, I'm practically penniless here and I messed the whole thing up. They're like, yeah, yeah, but that happens. And again, I didn't know anything about, about business, and that is what happens. There's ups and downs. I, I do the same thing now when I'm talent scouting, uh, and you'll see on, uh, like on a Shark Tank show or, or if you talk to venture capitalists, they don't want anyone who hasn't failed yet in business yeah. because of the lessons you learn. So I didn't know that, but these people were smarter than I was, and which is not saying much. They were very smart, and they said, no, we're, we like that because now you know what not to do. Right. Now, flash ahead, I translate that now into my consulting, and I can really spot the danger signs when people yeah. are having trouble in their business, it's heading for a crash, and I've helped many to mm -hmm. fend that off. But back yeah. then, I needed that help myself. Long story short, well, I guess it's already too long, but I, I took that job. What were the sales? What were you selling? Uh, it original? was uh, a number of different things. They had all different uh, uh, divisions of the company, like seven different divisions. But whatever it was, it was going out and door-to-door -door sales. So here I was, you know, law degree. I'd run a multi-million dollar business, and I'm on the street 
selling stuff door to door and trying to make 50 bucks a day or 100 bucks a day. Some days zero. Some yeah. days I got robbed of all my money. Like, and now I'm, I'm negative for the day because I had to pay for the goods I was selling. I mean, whole crazy thing. But the bottom line is I, I took this temporarily. So this will be some good training. I'll learn what they think it takes to run a business. Right. And then when I go back in the fall and run my business, I'll be that smart for it and they're going to pay me along the way. Sure. Well, what happened was I never went back to my business. So after this door-to-door -door sales, after a few months, I was like, why would I go back to my business when here they're about to hand me the keys to a location. I'm going to run a business. I'm going to make a six-figure income here. I, I enjoy what I'm doing here. I'm good at it. Yeah. And that's basically what happened. I stayed with that door-to-door -door sales for nine years. Wow. And that's an industry that people often don't last a week. Uh, many people wouldn't last a day. I mean, uh, that business was more of a recruiting business than anything else. We were constantly placing ads like the one I had answered, and we would interview 50 people a day, and we would narrow it down to a second interview for five or ten, and let them go out in the field and see the sales and spend the day with a manager, and at the end we'd hire one or two of them, so that's about ten people a week, and at the end of the week we might have you know two or three left, right. but that's a hundred people a year we're bringing in, so we'll do that over and over and over, and you know, lo and behold, the training for that was the door-to-door -door sales, the fact that most people are saying no. And they're saying, You're, this is stupid, and get out, and no soliciting. And so that's what happened when we're doing interviews. And they're like, what, are you crazy? I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. Get me out of here. So, But I did that for nine years. Oh. So that took me all the way up into the 90s. And I ended up uh, with that company. I moved from division to division. I became a troubleshooter. I was single. And so I took the opportunity to troubleshoot and travel around to other offices. I also traveled around each time for myself, learning a new division I had to go to. I went to Detroit, Michigan for six weeks. I went to Miami for four months. I went to uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania, all up and down the East Coast. Uh, and, and did door-to-door -door sales in all these different cities yeah. and helped offices grow. So it was a fantastic experience. And But then I did that until the nine years was until uh, I had started my fantasy sports game company in 84. That was about seven years. This thing was about 91 until the year 2000. Yeah, that was the wake-up call. Uh, I looked out my window on the Y2K year 2000 New Year's at the fireworks. I was in a hotel in Scranton, Pennsylvania, 40 years old, not married, no kids, no family, not even a home. I'm traveling around six weeks here, a month here, six months there troubleshooting, and I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing here? This is good for a kid, but I can't be doing 40 years old. And I'm in Scranton, Pennsylvania in a hotel watching the fireworks with no family. And life is passing me by, mm -hmm. and I pretty much just walked out right on the spot. I mean, I went into the manager after that uh, Christmas, New Year's break kind of thing, and I was like, you know, I just got to go. And I left what I was building, the managers I was training, and I just uh, took off and went to the next chapter of my career. But uh, one thing I found out later when I started I learned that there, there was this such a thing as direct response marketing. And once again, here, I've been doing it. Yeah. I've been doing direct marketing, right? Take something and do you want it or not? And the deadline is I'm leaving in two minutes out mm -hmm. the door. Like There was an offer. There was a deadline. It was the whole wow strategy right there. So I would walk in if I had like uh, kids' books. We did a lot of promotions for like Walt Disney books. So I would walk in back then. It was The Lion King, The Little Mermaid back in the 90s. And I'd walk in and go, you have any niece, nephews, kids? No. You know, if I so we did promotions for sports teams. We had tickets to the Hartford Whalers when I was in in Connecticut. The New York Yankees in New York. It's like, any hockey fans around? Yes, no. I mean, it was the Wow Strider's about the who. And if there wasn't a hockey fan in the office, I'm not going to sit there and go, I got a great deal on hockey tickets. What a waste of time. Right. So I'm like, you know, I'm wearing a Hartford Whalers hat and a suit, but I'm walking in going, hey, I've got a great deal from the Hartford Whalers. Any hockey fans? And the receptionist would go, Mike on the second floor, third cubicle, go see him. Great. I walk up there, Mike, you know, Mary down there says you're a hockey fan. I got four tickets, uh, buy one, get one free, or, four, or 20 tickets for 10 bucks, or whatever the heck it was, boom, irresistible offer. And that was the way I got it to him, by going right up and talking to somebody and then go to the next door. So that was great training. And, of course, I did learn how to run businesses and learn how to start new locations and train people and train managers. Great training, but I'd had enough. And that was time for the next chapter of my career. Later on, I was saying when I learned this, this thing about direct response marketing, I read that all the top people in direct response marketing will say the same thing. They'll say, the very best experience to become a great direct response marketer is that you at some point did door-to-door -door sales. Yeah. Well, at that point, I was like, hey, check it out. 
So those nine years really were <laughs> beneficial because, you know, I've met many people along the way that like, see, so for one summer I sold Cutco knives when I was a kid and that, there you go, I did that door-to-door -door sales or, you know, I did, I did uh, home alarms in homes for a month or whatever and I'm like, nine years, nine years. So, so Steve, what were the big, I want to hear all about... kinds of people, all kinds of situations, the very, I, I wish it on everybody, the very best training for direct marketing for direct response marketing is to yeah. go out and get to know people and go sell toe to toe nose to nose face to face not yeah. put up a website and wonder what to put and hope people come and you never have to see people it's just not how it works mm -hmm. i want to hear about the next chapter but i want to hear some of your big lessons with door-to-door -door sales what did you learn that worked i'll tell you one thing uh right away what i learned was um perseverance stickativity uh, like I, as soon as I was in which immediately we would encounter all kinds of just like rain. I mean, one day that it rained, I'm walking around getting rained on and getting doors slammed. I'm having a day again where I I don't make enough money to even you know chip in for for gas or or eat. And that's when I became homeless. It was within after about a month or so of having of doing that door to door sales. I was so bad at it and couldn't sell and couldn't do anything that I got evicted from a sixty dollar a week shared room in a house with a bathroom down the hall and come on now, I couldn't even make $10 a day. I didn't have a car, my car had broken down, couldn't fix it, so I had to chip in for gas with someone to drive me out somewhere, I had to like eat something, and then I needed $10 a day to pay this rent, I couldn't even do that. But I stuck with it. And so my thought went to, my goodness, if I had stuck with my multi-million dollar simulated sports business, my fantasy sports business, I wouldn't be here right now. I gave up way too early on that. I was like, hey, things are tough. This is going in the tank and like, what am I going to do about it? And it just went. And I didn't fight for my business. Mm. So that's the biggest lesson I learned right away was I didn't fight for my business. I gave up way too easy. And with this thing, I just didn't give up. Even then when I became homeless and now I was sleeping on, on somebody's couch over here and I was, uh, that, that night, I remember, I'll never forget that night I went back. It was a rainy night. And I went back and uh, to the room where I hadn't paid the rent, and the landlord was like, "Look, you got to pay. You got to pay, just like you I think you just see in the movies. Only I experienced it. Like, right. oh, you got to pay, or I'm throwing you out." Well, I went home that night, and all my stuff was outside, wow. in boxes and hefty bags and whatever. My stuff was out, and I couldn't get in. And it started raining, so I'm like, "What the heck? My stuff is getting rained on, whatever." And I got to go stay somewhere. I remember going to a hospital. There's a hospital nearby. I went in the waiting room. I was rudely woken up by somebody like whatever time going, you can't sleep here. Uh, you know, I, I clearly I wasn't really waiting for anybody, so get out of here. Then I went over, I found a, a Little League baseball diamond, and there was the dugout. And so that was nice. I was on a bench and the dugout. The problem is it was kind of windy and the rain was kind of blowing in sideways, so that mm -hmm. was no good. I'm still getting rained on. So I walked along and I remember getting to a college, and this was the summer, the college was out, and I actually climbed up the windowsill in the wall to the second floor climbed in a window and I slept on a metal box spring with no mattress wow. and no electricity. There was no electricity in the whole place. It was all off for the summer. But I had the window shade open and I got an east facing room and that's when the sun came up in the morning that would wake me up. Then I had to go and get like a mile back to the spot where I was going to get picked up by the guy who would pick me up every day on the way to go into the door to door sales. Well he picked me up, he looked at me and goes, what? I was still in the same suit, only got him rained on all night. Probably had, you know, a half a growth of beard or whatever. It looked like he's like, What happened to you? And I'm like, whatever, gotta go. Another day. Right. Now I didn't have that attitude when I had a multi million dollar business. How did I have that attitude when I was a door to door salesperson without a penny to my name? Because I saw the opportunity. And this time I, I had people around me. So I had the managers and assistant managers all cheering me on. I didn't have that when I was not an entrepreneur. Right. You know, I had a coach. Uh, he was a partner of Dan Kennedy for a time. I, my number one mentor in direct response, his name was Bill Glazer, and he had a saying, the entrepreneur is the loneliest person on the planet. And certainly that was me, and it was a big reason my business crashed. If I'd had a coach like I am now, if I had me coaching myself, never would have given up on that, on that fantasy sports game business. And who knows? Well... I like where my life is now, but who knows what would have happened. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been sleeping in a, in a dugout on a baseball field in the rain in a suit. But uh, that was the number one thing I learned was, man, fight for your business. Yeah. Don't give up. What did you Which learn about the... I think every door-to-door -door salesperson learns anyway because that's a tough gig. Yeah, that's, uh, that's wild.
Steve. Yeah. Um, that probably does seem like a movie when you think back on that. Yeah, I guess they could make a movie out of my life. You know, Tom Cruise or uh, <laughs> George Clooney probably would play, and here I am. I look just like um, So what did you learn from, from selling, like selling-wise? You know, because you have to even, not only get the person to keep the door open, not slam in your face, but then actually sell them something. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, you know, and again, that's uh, the genesis of the wow strategy. I learned it's all about them. Yeah. So if I went in the door with wherever I had and I started out with like, this thing is great and blah, blah, blah. And they'd be like, if it was a kid's thing, they're like, I don't have any kids. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, right. What did I just do? Or I'm not a hockey fan. So it doesn't matter that I have free tickets to the Hartford Whalers. I mean, so I, I make the analogy like, what kind, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream, Jeremy? Um, chocolate chip cookie dough I like. Okay, very nice. What flavor do you just not like? Uh, any type of fruit sorbet, orange sorbet, sorbet or something. Right? Yeah. So if I came yeah. up right now and I said, hey, I got a whole big thing here of free fruit sorbet in a nice cone, and I'm handing it to you. Just got to eat it right now. Here's a free fruit sorbet. Sounds good? Uh, no. If it's free, it but, but yeah, I don't really. If the yeah. person doesn't want it, they don't want it. Yeah. Maybe you're a diabetic even. Maybe you just can't even have it all together. I mean, so may, I don't like mint. If somebody said, here's mint chocolate chip, I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't care if it's free. I will pay you to take it away from me. Right. So that I learned, it's all about the who and not the what. Yeah. So that's, I, I say it all the time. The who is more important than what. People are so enamored with their product or their service. This is such a great thing. It does this, X, Y, Z, whatever. No, what does it do for them? So you got to translate your your features, we hear this a lot, into benefits for them. And so that's what I learned in that door to door sales is it's all about the who and it's not about, I mean I had a, a Walt Disney book, uh, a big oversized Lion King book that kids loved if they loved the Lion King and it was uh, like said right on it $40 and we were selling it for 5 bucks. Didn't matter if the guy didn't have kids. Right. Also there were some people who were going like Walt Disney uh, I forget now, but there was some some Walt Disney thing where they're anti this group of people or something. So you know my my people, you know my religion, so we don't buy from Walt. I was like, what? I mean, you hear all kinds of stuff. Like, I could have said it's a dollar. I could have said. I mean, maybe then they would have bought it just to burn it. I don't. But I mean, you know, it isn't about how good your thing is. Right. It's about finding the person who might want it, and then yeah. an irresistible offer. Now it's a full. You know, so now let's say we find the right person. I walk in, and there's Mary at the reception desk of an office. She's got six nieces and nephews. She just happens to go see that weekend. And I walk in with Lion King books, a Little Mermaid something, $40 books for five bucks. I'm her dream. I just solved that problem she had. She was going to have to leave work early, go to the store, wonder what to get, spend 100 bucks, and maybe get something. Now mm -hmm. she can drop 20 bucks and get four of these things. So you find the right person, you make an irresistible offer, and they'll buy. And so the door to door sales. It wasn't really sales. Salespeople, right. in fact, I would be interviewing salespeople, they go, this isn't sales. And I go, you're right, it isn't sales. I'm not convincing anyone. I'm not overcoming object. I'm not saying, oh, they're going, uh, uh, let's say, uh, I don't have any nieces or nephews. Well, do you have any friends that have nieces or nephews? Or why don't you save it in case you have one one day? I mean, what are you kidding? I didn't overcome any objections. Right. They objected. I'm like, have a nice day. I'll be back next week with something different. Right. Next week, I'll have a calculator. Next week, I'll have a pair of socks. The next week, I'll have a book, a cookbook. Uh, you know, when I was doing it, they had a whole books division. I'd have a cookbook, I'd have a golf instruction book one week, I'd have a kid's book another week. I'll be back. Like, and, and it's all about them. Is it something they would want? Yeah. Well, that translates into everyone's business. You're a chiropractor, right? I mean, if you know, you know that you can help everybody. How about this one? I used to suffer from allergies until I met a chiropractor who said, you know, that can be cured with an alignment. Or maybe you don't use the word cure or whatever, but I mean, if you align your neck, perhaps because your neck's out of alignment, you'll get rid of the allergies. I was like, what crazy? I heard of people getting 50 shots and taking all the tests and doing the whatever. And yeah, and I was massively allergic to dogs, and we had a dog. And my mom used to get me these, I had to take these pills and stay away from the dog and don't cuddle with the dog or whatever. And then lo and behold, I had, I don't know, a couple of these treatments with this chiropractor. And to this day, I'm not allergic mm. to like anything. It's amazing. I have a dog. I'm, my beautiful wife Michelle would not even know I was ever allergic to dogs. I'm I'm sleeping right there, cuddling with it. So I didn't know that. So if you're walking up to somebody and going, "Did you know that an alignment can help you and get rid of all your allergies?" and the person would look at you and go, "I don't have any allergies." Right. <laughs> what would you do? Keep selling to them, overcome that objection? Well, it'll help you in case you ever do, or what? You know, big mistake. 
you're a, you solve so many problems as a chiropractor, the key is to zero in on what issue they have and see if they want it solved, and then you don't have to sell. So the beauty of, of finding somebody with a problem that you can solve is you don't have to sell, especially if you make an irresistible offer. Right. And I learned that in the door-to-door -door sales because I knew it was very similar to the job I had in high school we were talking about last time, which was a vendor in Madison Square Garden walking around selling popcorn and, and hot dogs and beer and whatever. I wasn't selling either. I didn't walk up. If you were sitting in a seat at a Knicks game, believe me, I didn't walk up while they're playing and go, hey, Jeremy, 100% all beef. This is the finest ingredients, and the roll is 42% wheat and 32% something else, and has some nice sesame seeds which are imported from the wherever, and the this and the, you everyone would just boom me out of the stadium. So that some people will call that the difference between merchandising and sales. Merchandising, just you know, hey, I have something. Do you want it? Like a a newsstand on the corner. That guy doesn't he doesn't sell the paper either. He doesn't go, you know, hey, page 42 is a real good crossword puzzle today. You know, he's like newspaper, newspaper. I got a newspaper. You want it? Come and get it. So I'd walk around peanuts, you want to come and get it. Now I had to walk around, I had Lion King books or cookbooks or, or tickets to the Hartford Whalers or calculators or whatever I had. And it was like, that's what I got. We're doing a promotion, it's a great price if you can use it. If not, I got to go. And so I learned time management. I got to, if I'm going to clear out and sell 100 calculators, I got to find about 400 people to talk to. And about 300 of them are going to, in some variety of ways, throw me out, laugh at me, say get a real job, just say I don't need a calculator, it's too expensive, I don't like your tie, it does, whatever it is, I need 300 no's and I will get the 100 yeses. Well, I need a time management there. Yeah. I'm not hanging around and, and taking a long lunch break and what time is money, I, I learned that. I learned how to deal with all kinds of different people was the main thing. And this is why I was so terrible in the beginning that I was not a people person. I wasn't people today they, they come to me and they go, wow, you're such an outgoing people person. Right. Uh, what I was it like you, back then? You yeah, were... I mean, I was not. This is why, who else, think, let's think about it now. Who starts a statistical fantasy sports game company? <laughs> who loves to pour over statistics, input right. them into computers, program the computer, print out the, the newsletters, and make sure they're collated properly and get them out in the mail to the right people on the list? That is an analytical person. Right. That is not a life of the party people person. I love that kind of, I love sports statistics and watching the games and knowing, reading the back of baseball cards when I was a kid and knowing, memorizing all the facts of play. I mean, that's who I am, that analytical person. Yeah. Well, I go out in this door-to-door -door sales world and they're like, yeah, we want you to manage a location and we'll put you in there where nobody else would let me run a business after I just crashed that one. They go, we will, but you've got to master all the different areas and the first mm -hmm. one is door-to-door -door sales. Yeah. I couldn't sell a thing for a couple of months. I knew I got to get past this. I also knew, I just believed, that I was put here for a reason. I said, you know, there, there's something going on here. I was terrible at customer service in my business. I, I'm, I'm not that people person. I had great rules of the game, and the game worked well and all this, but I wasn't doing the best. I said, I, I know I need this. That's why I'm here, and I'm going to yeah. do it. And I also said to myself, I'm not going to quit until I get good at it. That's one thing I remember saying. I stink at this. I'm not, I'm not letting it beat me. I, I, I'm a game player. It's another person that starts a fantasy sports game. I love games. My mom, you know, was a game player and a bridge teaching bridge and a master grandmaster in bridge, and she went on a game show. And we were all about playing games and card games and every games, and it was always a challenge and a game thing. It was like sports. My dad loves sports. It's all a game and a challenge. So I saw this door to door sales thing as, look, I don't like this thing. I'm going to quit this thing, but I'm not going to let it beat me. Yeah. First, I'll get good at it, and then I'll make a decision. Now that I can do this, do I want to? And so it took me a while to get good at it, but that translated also into, which is why direct response marketers say, when you can do door-to-door -door sales and get good at that, you'll be able to write copy. You'll be yeah. able to now put an ad in the paper and say the right things and, and put something into writing in a, in, a, in a sales letter and be a copywriter. And so that was a, that was a great experience for me. And I, now, when people say, but you're a people person at my events, you know, you're outgoing and great. I go, yeah, there's one reason I'm really great. I studied it. I mean, I read Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, 57,000 million times, and Les Giblin, all these, you know, how to deal with people. I just read all those, I studied it, mm -hmm. and then I went out in the field every single day for 10 hours and met 400 different people every single day. So yeah. we'd meet the doctor or the nurse in the front, and then we go to the back 
of the uh, and we'd meet the dishwasher and the guy in the back of the restaurant and we'd mm -hmm. meet the maitre d in the front the dishwasher in the back and so we were meeting all different people wherever we went i was mm -hmm. interviewing different people meeting all of them i was training different people this was a a great experience something i just did not have and would not have gotten through law school or or running a statistical business or anything like that. Again, I, I wish it on, I, I don't really think right now you should drop everything you're doing. Jeremy, give up this whole chiropractic thing and go do door-to-door -door sales. However, uh, great, great training. Yeah. So how did you actually get over and push forward through those 300 no's? Because even though you know that, how did you stay motivated? Well, good question. And that's what I later on did as a manager is I helped... Uh, to 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 get people over that again I the main thing was I was surrounded by a team of people that were mm -hmm. cheering me up yeah. I had my manager and an assistant manager the manager location and there was a set system and they were like this is how it works yeah and in my second interview I mentioned before for you know we we threw 50 interviews a day to bring back like five or ten people let them spend the day with out in the sales field and through that whole day on the car ride out to whatever territory we're going to be traipsing around that day he let me know. He said, look, this is how it works. Hmm. I'm not a master salesperson who's going to convince anyone to buy anything. I'm just one of the hardest word working people you'll ever see. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see enough people that a lot of them are going to tell me no, and enough are going to tell me yes to sell everything I have here in the trunk, and I'm going to go home with a full pocket again today. So, you know, check your brain at the door. I know you're real smart, Steve, and you have a law degree and you're out of business, and none of that matters here. It's just hard work. Get out there and just go to the next door, the next door, the next door, and somebody's going to say, I mean, think about it. If I have $40... Lion King books for five dollars, and I go to four hundred doors. Yeah, I, I, it, it, you know, there's a saying in in Olson Direct Response Marketing: you can't say the right thing to the wrong person. You can't say the wrong thing to the right person. I could walk into the lady with the six kids and nieces and nephews and go, "You're ugly," and I have Lion King books for five dollars that list for forty. She go, "Wow, <laughs> I hate you. Give me eight of them." Like that's just how it would go. And then on the other hand, I walk up to somebody who goes, "Man." You, that was a great sales pitch. I love it. You're hard working. I don't have any kids myself, so I'm not going to buy. But man, you are good. I'm like, could you have just thrown me out and you know, <laughs> saved me those 42 seconds? I got to get to the next door. So a no is a no. A yes is a yes. And just keep going. And that's a great thing to learn. Time management. So Stick it to moving on. I mean, if I came back at the end of the day and I hadn't made sales, there was a whole and the whole office was full of people with fistfuls of cash going. It worked again. Keep at it. You know, there were days where they would drop me off. And I would just sit on the curb until they pick me up for lunch. They go, how's it going? Yeah, nobody's buying. Well, they probably knew what was going on. But I'm like, I, I didn't even have enough nerve to get thrown out of another door and go right. talk to another person. Or I, I had lost my motivation. Well, that's when the manager's there to pick me up. Right. And he said, you know what? You're coming out tomorrow in the field with me. Yeah. Let's go out there. Let's go have some fun. Let's go. If we don't sell anything, it's fine. And I was like, what are you talking about? We have to sell after eat. He said, you know, that's what I learned. It's the same in running your business. If you're not enjoying, if you don't get up every day, Jeremy, and come to your chiropractic and enjoy it, you really ought to be doing something else. Right. The money will come if you show and you enjoy it. People are coming up to see you, and hopefully you're not Mr. Grump coming out of the back going, oh, I got to, you know, fix your back again. Oh, another person with a back thing. What? Hopefully that isn't you. Right. So if that was me in the door-to-door -door sales, it wasn't working, and it was a manager would grab me, somebody else in the office would grab me, and having that camaraderie. So this yeah. is why later on, when I became a coach and a consultant in business, I always had group coaching. I had individual coaching, because I, and I, had, I ran these events for entrepreneurs. I know yeah. you attend at least one of them. I yeah. always want people surrounded by others. So when you're going as an entrepreneur through the inevitable ups and downs of business, I don't want you to be the loneliest person on the planet. I want you to have somewhere you can go when times are down. Yeah. And so, for instance, you're a chiropractor, and you might think uh, if your thing isn't going good, you might think, well, see, chiropractic is just isn't going good these days. There's this Obamacare or medical thing. Now, I'm sure I don't know what I'm talking about, but I mean, whatever's going on, chiropractor just isn't the thing and whatever. But what if you walked in and there were 10 other chiropractors? going like, what a fantastic day, more patients than I've ever had. You'd be going like, can I slink off in the corner here? But like, all right, at least you'd, you'd have enough motivation to go out and try it again the next day. Or let's say you placed an ad that didn't work, and you said, you know, Steve, I thought you said, you know, this is a great ad, it didn't work, and then you come into a group where there's 10 other chiropractors all placed the same ad and got all these great results. You might be saying, hmm, let me give it another shot, or maybe there's one thing I did wrong in the ad. Instead of just allowing if you're alone, you allow yourself to just go, that didn't work. Right. And that's what I did in my multi-million dollar business. Did not have a coach, did not have a support group, 
I gave up way too easy and let it go. And this door-to-door -door sales, it was the complete opposite. Yeah. So it's a well-structured thing. And I, and I structured my, my coaching and my, 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 my consulting business as it is now pretty much. It's a, a piece of pretty much everything I've ever done. Right. But a lot of it is based on that door-to-door -door sales and that group stickativity and motivation. It's a key thing. We all know as entrepreneurs, I mean, I won't put you on the spot, but I mean, has every day been fantastic in your business? Like Never is, yeah. It just doesn't happen yeah. unless you work in a factory. If you work in a factory or you work in a whatever, I mean, no, well, there it's not good because you always hate your job. <laughs> It's amazing. All these people will say is, I, I, everyone, you know, I hate my boss. I hate my job. They ask them, you know, see any survey. If you win a lottery, what do you do? First thing, quit my job. Okay, so who are you going to vote for as a politician? Well, the guy that says we need more jobs. We need more jobs. Come on, get more jobs. In fact, we're going to, you know, go sit in on Wall Street for more jobs. I want a job. But you hate a job. But you hate your boss. You hate your job. I don't understand the whole thing. Like, do something you love. There's a cliche, do something you love and the money you follow. It's not that simple. Right. You got to do the right thing. I mean, I love, you know, like, let's say I love doing a crossword puzzle. I love watching TV. I love watching TV. I love watching a movie. If I do that really well, am I rich? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not just do what you love and get paid, right. which is another reason these kids are upset when they go get a college degree in whatever. And then they're like, but I can't find a job in my major. Who told you to go to a liberal arts school and take a sociology major and, like, think you're going to, you know, have a career? Come on now. Pick up a hammer and the nails and go out there and <laughs> learn something and go give some value to people and give value back. So, Steve, you mentioned danger signs. Like, you're able, because of what you went through, you're able to see this when you consult. What are some of the danger signs you've seen with some of the clients that you've helped? Great question. Well, that's one of them. One of them is going slipping into the negativity and being unable to get out. So if I had a, a whiteboard behind me, I would draw two circles, uh, and they go in opposite directions. I, so I call one the cycle of success. So if you have a, a positive expectancy, you will take action, and if you take that right action, you will get great results. And by getting great results, you'll have a better positive attitude and expectancy, so you'll take more action, mm -hmm. you'll get more results, you'll have a better attitude, you'll take more action, and you'll just go around and around in this cycle, and it's very difficult to get out of there. Now you're like, hey, anything I do is fantastic, I'm going to take more action, I'm the king, I know what I'm doing, things are happening, boom. Here's the problem, this cycle goes in the other direction, is the cycle of failure, equally mm -hmm. or more difficult even to get out of. And mm -hmm. this is where if you don't take action, then you don't get any results, and then you have a negative attitude, which causes you to not take any more action and not get any more results and have even a worse attitude. And you get in this downward spiral. And to get out of that is a support group. Right. That's the number one thing I see. So the danger sign I see when people don't have a support group and they're in this negative spiral. Yeah. And by not getting results, so I would say, and it happens all the time, I would say to you if you came to me and said things are bad, three straight years of stagnant or no growth and things are going bad, I'm thinking of closing it up. And I'd say, well, what things have you done, you know, that uh, that have worked? Or what things have you tried? Or have you tried this? You know, I tr tried that. doesn't work. Yeah, but you haven't tried it the way I do it. Yeah, no, it won't work. And this won't work. Because you have this negative attitude, because you've had negative results in the past, and you're so deep into this cycle yeah. that sometimes it's very tough, even for me, to shake somebody out of there. I'm usually able to because I have something that works so well that I can get you that good result that at least you have a glimmer of going, hmm, that was a good result. I have a little bit of glimmer of hope, so I will take a little bit more action. Right. I get a little more results, and I can get you over into the positive cycle and the positive circle. Mm -hmm. So number one danger sign is alone, isolation. Mm. With no support group, it's very easy to fall into that negative cycle because negative things always happen. Yeah. So if you don't have someone to help you out, that's a, that's a big warning sign. So I, I will look at that. Any other big danger signs that you see besides isolation? Um, Another big danger sign is, yeah, you know, there's a, 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 you know, my age. Now, I just had my 55th birthday yesterday. So, Happy birthday. Thank you. But I, I'm in a position where uh, uh, I, I coach and consult with many people in a similar position to me. They've been running their business for 25, 30 years, and they've lost the, 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 the flame has gone out. Mm -hmm. You know, if you remember, I don't know if you do, the first day you opened the door to your practice to your location how excited you were I remember taking a photo of myself with a box I had a friend take a photo to help me move there was the name of the company on the door and how excited I was but then later on as I talk to people and they'll come to me I'll say what are your goals 
well, I, I just want to survive. And, you know, I just want to stick it out in these tough times and this or so. I'm going, do you even remember what your goal was when you opened your business? It certainly wasn't to survive. Right. It certainly wasn't to stick it out. It certainly wasn't to just make, so they've lost this fire. And often, by taking on this whole new world to them of direct response marketing, it gives them a second wind. So that's a big warning sign to see this burnout when somebody goes, you know, uh, it's just not exciting anymore to me to do the business. I'm like, well, then maybe we should be doing something else. But before you do that, why don't we decide that we're in a different business? So you would decide, I'm no longer in the, in the business of being a chiropractor. I'm in the business of marketing a chiropractic practice. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a whole new world now, right? Because how many hours do you really need to spend to continue to be an excellent chiropractor. Sure, you got to keep up on the latest machines or this or that and go to the, you know, get your credits and do whatever, but you're an expert and you do not have to spend lots of hours on it. So maybe you got some time to now delve in and start to become an expert in direct response marketing. Right. Read some of the, the books. I got a, a bunch of the classics behind me, like get in there and, and start watching infomercials, you know, start skipping through the shows and watching the commercials and getting into marketing. And getting into what I call the translation of instead of just going, well, yeah, that's a, that, but that's an ad for a sham wow. What does that got to do with a chiropractor? But instead, get into like, hey, sham wow, they're selling a lot of that ridiculous one piece of cloth for 20 bucks. How are they doing that? Maybe there's something in there that I can use in my chiropractic. Right. You know, probably not going to stand there and be obnoxious and say, we can't do this all day and talk on a headset. Or but let me find something in there. And now you get excited. So people are now excited to be going, all right, what else can I learn about this direct response? What else can we test? And they get the second wind back. So big warning sign is when the wind has gone out and the goals disappear and, and an entrepreneur gets into a survival mode. That just, to me, it's a disconnect. It's not why we're an entrepreneur. You know, people come to America and very often, I think I saw something, although I don't know how they track it, but it said something like 40% of the Fortune 500 companies were started by immigrants. Like yeah. Americans, in my and anecdotally, in my experience, and I have met a lot of Americans doing door-to-door -door sales all over the country. Like the a person born in America, I don't want to use this. It's 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 a cliche to use this word feeling of entitlement, but they're they're born in America and they want things like a good union job, and I want a good pension, and I want a good salary and a guaranteed benefits, and I want. But people come from other countries; they're just happy to be here. They don't need. They they want an opportunity. In fact, they'll sweep the floors. And, and clean the toilet and do whatever they have to do so that 10 years later they can be running that restaurant or running that business. That's what they want and then they'll start another and another. So again a cliche but I, I saw certainly walked into enough at least anecdotally in my door to door sales business but a motel or a convenience store were almost, almost, all, almost always owned by an immigrant who was willing to work a ridiculous number of hours. Right. If I pull up to that motel and it's 3 in the morning that person comes out from their bedroom and goes you rang the bell Give me twenty seven dollars and here's a room. And that that's not going to be an American in my in my experience. Born in America, that person's going to be on their mom's couch, going, "There are no good jobs out there for me." And I refuse to, you know, what do you mean, work twenty four hours a day in a motel? I'm like, really? These are some of these kids that go into the service, right? Well, now you're working twenty four hours a day, guy. In fact, you're away from your family for like a year. So it's just like I did when I had ruined my door to door sales company and then I was, I mean, my, my fantasy sports game company by not really fighting for it. These kids who don't fight mm. and then they end up in the military and it's like, now what do you think? Now you're working 168 hours a week. I don't even care if you think it's downtime at the, at, in the tent you're living in, in Afghanistan. You are there. You're on the job. And you're on call at the very least. If you hear a bomb, you're out there. Like, so you're on call. You don't see your family. Like, if you could take it back. To where you weren't in the army overseas and sacrificing all this, would you have worked a little harder on your job or in your business, right? So a warning sign is losing that 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 immigrant feeling that I'm just happy to be here and I'm looking for opportunity. This is America; it's a land of opportunity. It's not the land of guaranteed handouts and guaranteed pensions or what. That is the and it's right now the downfall of cities. I live here in Chicago. It's going to be the downfall of Chicago. All the pensions that are unfunded that they can't afford, and their city's going to go bankrupt. That already happened in Detroit and elsewhere. Like, because that's just not the American way. Another right. concept, by the way, that I just dislike entirely is this concept of retirement. When did this come along? I, I understand that when they started this retirement. Again, I haven't studied a lot, but this retirement or or pension or whatever they chose the age sixty-five. That was about the expect life expectancy when this started. 
Now what's the life expectancy? It's over 70s and something. So shouldn't the retirement age should be moved? They never plan to be funding people's entire, like a second life for after 20 work. years, 30 for years. For 20 yeah. years without working. Like I, me, I, I had to fire a financial advisor once years ago because he could not understand that I was never going to retire. He, that's, that's all his pitch was. He, he must have been pretty new because he could not. I kept down. I said, have you ever worked with, like, do you have any, any clients that are entrepreneurs? Like, have you ever worked with business owners? Like, don't t retire. I don't even understand. So retire from what? Here I am on a Skype thing on a computer talking to somebody, and hopefully this goes out and helps some people to grow their business. What am I going to retire from? What, what am I? Am I, I don't too tired to do that, too old to do that, too sick to do that? Like, you know, and that, so then he came. I'll never forget the, the moment that he, he lost his, his, his advisorship of us was when he goes, yeah, well, but uh, what if you get hit by a bus? I mean, that's what he stooped down to. I was like, I'm never retiring. I can write a book. I can put up a blog podcast. I can do an interview. I, I can teach people. I'm never going to retire. Well, you got a plan for the few. For what if, what if you get hit by a bus? That's what he had. I said, well, have you ever heard of this guy Stephen Hawking? Like, if they put me in a wheelchair and all I can move is my mouth, but I can somehow type with it or talk with it or record something, I'm going to do that. Right. So I'm not going. So this whole notion of retirement is also a big problem, and and it's to me un-American. And when 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 people come to this country and they're just happy to be here and they just want to build something and they're not looking to have it easy and retire, and that's the problem. So when a business owner gets that way, and says, you know, uh, I don't want to do any of that marketing, or I don't want, like you might say to me when I said, why don't you change your job title from chiropractor to marketer of chiropractic services? And you would say, look, I don't want to learn all that marketing stuff. I just want more patients coming in the door, Steve. I just want to crack backs. Or I'm sorry. I just want to do whatever I do. I just want to, I just want to do the doing. I love, and chiropractors, i got to tell you, actually, are, are guilty of this more than many other people. There aren't a lot of, like, roofers that go, I just love hammering. But there's chiropractors <laughs> that go, I just love people. I love helping people right. and, and performing the, the, the uh, you know, the, the manipulations and the adjustments on the people. I just love that. So they're really averse to like sitting down and doing some good marketing. Well, that's a problem. So when I see that, that's a warning sign. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you don't have the respect for marketing and you don't think it's a necessity and something fun to do and something to do, you're going to be hurting, especially in the current economy, which people are not, they're still spending money. We're just not spending it as easily as we used to in a boom time. And so you yeah. really got to give people a reason why to spend money with you. So the fire has to be there. You have to have goals and growth in mind. And you got to be looking to do whatever you can to make it grow. When I see that's not happening, big, big warning sign. Mm -hmm. Steve, you said that you were you had that awakening. You're in Scranton. What was the next chapter? What did you do next? After you know what? I just years? remembered. I wasn't in Scranton. I was in Allentown, oh, Pennsylvania. Allentown. Yeah. Now that I my fault because I I remember I was on like the eighth floor and I'm like, there's no eighth floor hotel in Scranton. I was on the eighth floor of a hotel in downtown Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, but um. So I'm sorry, my brain just waited. Yeah. So the next it. chapter after you just were like, I can't do this anymore. Ah. So wow. Yeah, that was a big one because that wasn't as simple a transition as looking for an ad in the paper. Here, what I was 40 years old. I mean, so uh, part of me said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back and start a fantasy sports game business. Uh, that's what I love to do, and I'm going to do that only now. I'm not going to, you know neglected and and not fight for it and uh, now I'm really good with people that's going to help and and that's what I'm going to do something I love to do but I got to get the money for that now there were computers and it was a whole big deal now I had to get a programmer and computers and uh, it was probably I needed six figures I remember back then I needed to put six figures to really pay a programmer because I couldn't just say I have a game anymore and by hand do statistics or buy a thousand dollar Radio Shack computer. Yeah it's getting more and technical. Actually, yeah I had to get people where they can go on the internet and do their thing. So I knew I needed like six figures. So what am I going to do? And what I did there was I spent about six months or so liquidating everything I had in warehouses mm. around the around the East Coast mostly. So I would have, you know, however many items over here and over here. And back then I had found eBay, which was pretty much new. But I sat in that hotel room in Allentown and went and cleared out all my storages. And back then there was no, I don't know if people now buy or sell on eBay, but there's this thing called PayPal that Elon Musk uh, invented uh, and then he sold it to eBay. But, and it's the way people can pay over the computer. Back then there was none. It was all checks, money. Right. 
So I had this whole apartment with three piles of stuff. Here's the stuff that I got to like write the, the, the descriptions for and take the photos and put it up. Here's the stuff that's already up there and waiting to be sold. And so when the check com or and here's the stuff that's already sold and just waiting for the checks to come in and then I can take it over to the post office. I mean, nowadays, as soon as it's sold, you, you just go deliver it. I mean, people even do drop shipping. But I mean, this, the whole apartment is taken over with a bunch of garbage. I mean, just a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff. I'm selling everything, but I'm not just selling all the stuff I had in warehouses. I'm selling all my books, all my Zig Ziglar tapes that had gotten me through all those tough times in my car where I didn't want to get out of the car and go sell and all the, all the books and all the everything. And I'm just liquidating everything. And all I had to do was sell about $2,000 a month worth and I could pay the rent and eat. And that's what I did for a bunch of months. I just kind of survived and got rid of my stuff. So that kind of ran out after a few months. And uh, what I did was I contacted a high school buddy of mine who had taken a whole different track from me, sort of similar, but he had stayed in New York. I went to high school in New Jersey. And he had uh, gotten a job as, an, uh, as a trader in the uh, Amex, the American Stock Exchange. And he went in every day for it had been like 15 years now and he had gone through the roaring 90s if people remember where they're just making so much money it's ridiculous and so here was the year 2000 late in the year 2000 and uh, it was getting to be yeah about the spring of 2001 I remember and I was like alright so I missed out on this whole boom but let's get in it now you know I'm good with numbers again I'm deep down on that statistical analytical guy I'm real I can be a trader here I can instantly compute in my head that when I went to take the aptitude test when I went he just he opened a door for me and gave me someone's name that's hired he said my firm isn't but they're hiring and I went in because he had called me several times over the air I remember saying dude you gotta do this this is money you can do this you just come in every day and you say buy sell whatever and you're making tons of money what's with the door to say what are you doing so now I, I, I called him. he opened a door and uh, and uh, when I took the test, they were like, "Wow, no, almost nobody scored as high on this aptitude test," and 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 that's incredible. Like I was that fast with the numbers and 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 this computation. So here I was going to be a trader. Well, what happened is this company was um, they they were trading on the Amex, but they were located in Chicago, where there was the Chicago Board of Options, the the CBO it's called, the Chicago Board of Options Exchange or whatever, and that was the center of the firm. That, had, that also had their traders in New York. So they sent me to Chicago for six months of trading. That's when I came to Chicago. Mm. So I came to Chicago in uh, about April 2001 for a six-month training program. And then I was going to be on the floor. Well, I was on the floor, but then I was going to have my own. You know, they hand you millions of dollars to trade with. Mm. They're not just going to hand it to you until they trade you. But that's what my friend Mike was always telling me. He goes, look, they, they give you the money to trade. And they teach you because you, they have like 15 or 20 different pits that each have like 10 stocks around them on all the TV screens. you got to watch them all. They have a system that works. This is how we described it, which is how it is. The system works. He can't be in every pit at once, so he hires traders, puts money in their account, teaches you his system. And when you prove to him you can do it, he puts you into a pit. And you profit. You make money and you pay him a share and you keep a share and you make a ton of money. And like this is entrepreneurial. You make more. You make. You work. You're, you're on your own working and the more you make the more you keep and you gotta be good with the numbers and you're hanging around and I was like this is exciting it's a game it's, I, I remember the first time I walked into the stock exchange I was like it's like walking in I don't know if anyone remembers first time you walked in the casino and the slot machines are going and the action and the lights and so some people are like whoa but to me it's like this is exciting mm -hmm. All right. so came to Chicago April 2011 kinda of from telling you that date and telling you it's a six month trading period it might set off some light bulbs now in people's minds about what happened as I got towards the end of that trading period right. and how it kind of never ended because about a month before I was going to end the trading came this little thing we now know as September 11th 2001 at which point the entire stock market and that whole financial industry just kind of like imploded yeah. and that whole boom just went away so I got in on the fantastically absolutely worst timing wrong time to get into this industry and my firm was not continuing to train me or anyone else they were getting rid of people left and right and they went down from a hundred people to six or whatever you know and then how am I gonna get a job with another firm they're all getting rid of people and the whole thing is collapsing and whatever and so there I was now I was in Chicago and I was out of a job so I could go back to New York I could go anywhere else I, I like Chicago I was like let's stay here let's do something and I went and that's when I got a job with a consulting firm 
and I started to consult to small business owners for this firm that was located just outside of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the, uh, I think before that I, I took another sale, but I took a couple of sales consulting type of things. And that's when I decided, you know, like, let's, uh, you know, do some consulting on my own, set up for these companies. And then I, I became a consultant on my own. Yeah. Then later on, I became this certified Dan Kennedy advisor consultant. And I started to consult the people that like direct response marketing and, and the rest is history from there. But, uh, yeah, those are kind of the steps in between. Was that yeah. interesting yeah. at all? Yeah. Yeah. For that's it's really you know, interesting. George Clooney, when he plays me in the bad movie, timing, he's be horrible timing, <laughs> horrible timing. But so, what's been some of your proudest moments? Um, oh, you know, with clients I, I and coaching. My proudest moment is is and and maybe it's to my detriment, but my proudest moments are always when I help somebody else. Yeah. You mentioned in the introduction when you said this vicarious thrill. Uh, you know, it might not be the smartest thing, but uh, that's just the way I am. And and I think that comes from my mom being a school teacher. Like, I just love to see someone else's success. So, I, for instance, I will never forget the first manager that I promoted in my door-to-door -door sales days way back after I was in the field. By the way, it was supposed to be a three- to six-month training period that took me 13 months. That's how bad I was. And so, uh, but then I had my own location. And now I did the same thing. I placed the ads. I trained the people. And when I promoted my first promotion to running her own location and giving her the keys, that is that still to this day is the most exciting thing. Uh, that because it was one thing for me to do it, but to help her go through the ups and downs. And she was married, and her husband was always barking at her. What are you doing? This is crazy. And being a woman was extra tough doing the door-to-door -door sales and. And no respect from the guys in the office and the people in the field and the air. And, and that was a big thrill for me to help somebody else go from answering that ad to getting their own business. Yeah. And so now that's what I do now in my consulting business. Watching somebody who came to me struggling, wondering what to do, giving them some strategies and concepts and watching them and helping them along the way to implement it. And then they have massive success. That I love more than anything. Yeah. That's my favorite thing. Yeah, you know, Steve. So, what's one of your favorite success stories from consulting the small businesses? Um, did I mention this one? I know last. I don't remember which ones because I, you know, I'll tend to tell the same story. I guess maybe it's like you know, comedian will tell the same jokes over and over, but I'll tell the same stories. Did I tell the one about the 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 group of lawyers that were doing the uh, IRS? Is that tax seat? defenders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, t talk about that. Go into the detail because you you mentioned briefly about it, but. Tell, you know, tell me what you did with them and what worked. So I didn't think I used their name because they're still around today. Oh. But um, this was one I had gone to. I don't remember the exact timing, but it was pretty much right after the collapse of the 9-11 the and the whole stock market thing collapsed. Mm. I think I, I answered an ad and they said, you know, we're getting, the ad said too many leads. I said, we have too many leads coming in. We can't close them into sales. We need someone who can close them into sales. I'm like, I know I can do that. So let's go in there and... I helped this business was a, a, a you know a part-time attorney and one part-time one salesperson who was really she was someone they knew who had been in HR so they thought she's good with people she'll do the sales she was terrible at the sales the attorney couldn't do the sales either and I came in and I put together a whole sales process in place a whole script if you will put the whole thing together and then I started hiring and training other salespeople and built a team and I got the thing up to I think we had uh, I was there for nine months, and we went from that one part-time employee to 17 full-time employees. Was bringing in, you know, a million dollars. I forget what it was bringing in, but it also retired the the part-time attorney. Now became full-time inside the company, which mm. was his dream. He went from you know just working nights in this thing and trying to get it going to he could leave a six-figure, you know, thing at a big law firm in Chicago and come over and do this and had other people working, helping, and then all the people were helping with their IRS problems, many of which, most of which were small business owners. Because I don't know if you or any other small business out there that are watching, but a lot of us get in trouble with uh, the withholding is the biggest thing the IRS gets small business owners in trouble with. If they're having trouble in their business, they might kind of dip into that fund for the, from the withholding of people's paychecks. IRS, worst thing. They do not like that. It's not even like paying your taxes. This is stealing from the IRS. You're withheld the IRS's money from their paycheck, and you've got to give it back to the IRS every quarter. And if you don't, they yeah. really come down harder. Yeah. So we were we were helping a lot of small business owners, which is my wheel. I just love doing it. 
And so uh, that's what I did with the with this uh, this company, which at one point I learned a, a big lesson here is where the guy who was uh, doing the marketing and getting the leads, at once I got the hang of this sales thing, and I had it down. It took a few weeks of you know stumbling and bumbling, and I, I landed. This is what I'm going to say and do. Uh, he said, you know, can I sit next to you for a couple of days? I'm just take notes and listen to everything you say. We're recording the calls, and I was like, yeah, sure, well, so, you know. Have a few, have a blast. What is this exciting? This is you know, it is to me. It's interesting. Well, what he did, he he told me later. He said that's how I wrote our new sales letter. I just mm. took what you were saying, and it took a bunch of calls to get through all the objections and all the different situations. So it ends up being a you know a twenty page sales letter from each one hour from one one hour calls all put together. And to this day, last I heard from him less than a year ago, they're still I can't imagine they're not. They're still using that letter. Wow. Well. That they've now used for 15, 14 years, and uh, actually, uh, when I, I caught up with him, uh, he met, had me come down and meet him in his office. They got a beautiful downtown office. I mean, we were in a, a really pit location, and they have a beautiful office, big boardroom, and this. And I'm like, look at this place, whatever. So, how fantastic is that? The the full time jobs and the lives we've helped, and all of the clients yeah. they helped, and and the dream. That I helped those attorneys. They had that dream of building that business. So I just love stuff like that, and it's yeah. because they they did direct response marketing, did the right things, and and that was the first time that uh, that was Joe. The first time that he said to me, uh, you know, door to door sales experience. Dan Kennedy says it's the number one thing you look for in a salesperson mm. or in a copywriter. And uh, you got nine years, and uh, where you been my whole life? <laughs> and uh, I was like, wow, that was the first time I'd ever heard somebody say anything positive. About the nine years daughter, I certainly didn't hear it from my family. It's not certainly not like I went home to Thanksgiving dinner. And my mom was all proud of like, "There's my son with the law degree." Yeah, he's peddling crap on the street for five bucks. Like it wasn't, they weren't too happy with that. But here was somebody going, "Hey, that's hey, a brutal wow. Thanksgiving." <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. Well, you know, and I was running locations at that point, so you know. But yeah, my whole family is there. They're business owners, or a doctor, or a lawyer, or whatever. And I. You know, I just picture my poor mom, uh, go, you know, having a, you know, what's your son doing? Well, he's, he's walking around in the rain today, trying to sell calculators for five bucks and having three hundred doors slammed on his face. How's your kid doing? Like, you know, not the greatest thing, but uh, my, <laughs> the great thing about my mom was she always said, you know, you do what you want to do, right. and I know you'll be great at it, and yeah. I'll support you whatever you do. Now, yeah. like I said, that kind of came back to haunt her, because uh, there I was with a law degree and having run a multi-million dollar business. And there I was on the street doing door-to-door -door sales. And my dad, who was a top salesperson, business owner his whole life, and when I told him what I was doing, I described the opportunity, of course. Man, check this out. I'm going to start doing this, but in three to six months, I'm going to be running and making a six-figure income and running a multi-million dollar business. And uh, after all that, he was like, yeah, but you're, you're doing door-to-door -door sales on the street. I was like, yeah, but it leads to this, and these people are great, and I trust them. And I, mean, and I, I never forget, he said to me, uh, but isn't that just a hustle for kids? I was like, yeah, it is. I was 31 years old at the time. Because uh, like I said, it was nice. did nine years, and I was 40, and so what am I doing? But I was, I was 31 years old, and uh, yeah, my assistant manager that trained me was 21. I called him the 21-year-old snot-nosed kid. I still do today, and he's, uh, he's still with that company and, and oversees like 40 locations or whatever, oh. and he's very successful. But, uh, you know, I was one of the oldest people in the office, and uh, yeah, it was a hustle for kids. And I said, yeah, but you know what? I'm going to do it too. And so, kind of like Robert Redford, another person that looks just like me, Robert Redford in The Natural, like, you know, the old man coming to play baseball and being the rookie, like, or there was another movie, The Rookie, The Old Man, I, that was kind of me, yeah, it was, isn't that just a hustle for kids, was my dad, yeah. and my mom, just not understanding at all, and going, well, I, I guess it's coming back to haunt me that 30 years ago, I told this kid, whatever you do, I'll support you, so, you know, here he is doing <laughs> this, and, uh, I, so I, until I met a a direct response marketer never had somebody go, wow, nine years door-to-door -door sales experience. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's kind of a nice rush. I mean, yeah. uh, I certainly didn't get that when I was knocking on those doors. Steve, I have one last question. I appreciate your time. Before I ask it, where can we point people towards to find out more about you, to check out uh, all your, your great stuff? Oh, I appreciate that. I mean, you can go to my site. It's just my name, stevecypress.com. I don't know if you put it up there on the screen or below somewhere. I will put it's it up there, yeah. S-I-P-R-E-S-S. -S -S, or they can go to thewowstrategy.com. Yeah, I'll put it up there. My last question is, I know you mentioned one of your, you know, the mentors that influenced you is Bill Glazer. 
And I was wondering what was a big lesson you learned from, from Bill? Yeah. The greatest thing I learned from Bill was Bill is a third generation retail store owner. His grandfather started a retail store and then his father took it over and then he did. So I can only imagine that almost from birth, he was in that store all the time. Right. He was sweeping floors. He was helping with inventory. He was putting price tags on things. You know, So he was working seven days a week, 20 hour day. I mean, that's what retail, come on, that's what we do. And then he found this direct response marketing and he started using it in his retail store. But then eventually he took that under the, the suggestion of Dan Kennedy, his and my mentor, and Dan said, your stuff is so good, you ought to sell it to other menswear store owners. And then he started selling it to other general retailers. And then he became Dan's partner and started teaching all of us business owners of all kinds. So he, here's someone who came from the hard work and, and, and running a business, really right there down and dirty, to helping a lot of people. And he did it by by getting good at something and then teaching others what you do. So what, what I really can't stand is a whole ivory tower of people teaching things that they've never done themselves yeah. or they aren't fantastic at. So, you know, we mentioned I went to law school and we used to say in law school uh, when we had our, our class in corporate law, for instance, the guy was teaching corporate law and he was making, now this is the 80s, he was making 40, 50, 60,000 a year, whatever. Corporate lawyers are making three, 400,000. Now they make a million. But back then they were making a few hundred thousand. We're like, so this guy by definition could not have been a good corporate lawyer. He wouldn't be here. And yeah. in fact, there was that. I didn't care that much, but people would say stuff like, oh, I looked him up. You know, he couldn't get a job at the top firms or he whatever. He's not, you know, and that's how, kind of how it is through school. It's like people are teaching that don't know what they're talking about. Right now, I'm sorry, I'm not a, a political guy, but we have a guy, a president running a company who has never run a business. You never really run any, so he, so it's no wonder the economy, he has no idea what to do with the economy. Now, on the other hand, we have like, now it's an election campaign, so you have someone like Donald Trump or Carly Fiorina go, well, I know how to run a business. Well, who knows what they would do with, with you know, nominating Supreme Court justice, <laughs> like the rest of the streets or, or foreign countries. Or, so, you know, is the presidency like mm -hmm. too big for one person? But anyway, I mean, it's terrible to watch politicians. I'm here in Chicago. It's the same thing. They're running the city and they're running it into the ground, and they're they're and and colleges are filled with professors that are teaching kids that are going to go out in the real world and don't know how to run a business and build a business and be successful in the real world. And so I, I just can't stand all that stuff. Right. So one thing I love about Bill is he came from being a a member. Of, of uh, a student of Dan Kennedy, just like me, then he became Dan Kennedy's partner. Well, how cool is that? Yeah. So that's to me. That is there's the 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 goal. To me, also, I love that as a mentor. I love that. I love for someone who, and I've done that with a couple of my clients. They've come to me as a member of my group, and then they become a member of my advanced coaching group, and then maybe a private client. And then I've partnered with them in a business. Now they've reached a level where we can partner together in a business. So Bill did that with Dan Kennedy, and I was like. That's the way to do it. Get really good at something. Teach lots of other people. Partner with your mentor. So you're not your mentor, Dan Kennedy, just didn't get anyone off the street and go, be my partner. He took a student who had done so well as a student. He said, now you can be my partner. And I love that. And I think uh, a lot, I, I, I speak for a lot of the, the members of that company. It was called GKIC, Glazer Kennedy. And uh, we really appreciated that Bill was one of us. Yeah. He was a member just like us who then became a partner with Dan Kennedy. How cool is that? When, once Bill sold the company, corporate outside corporate entity bought it and brought in a president from the outside and a this and a that. And it was like nobody had any respect. I don't know, nobody. But a lot of us just lost total respect. We're like, they don't even know what, they're not one of us. How are they teaching us? They've never used it. They don't know what it is. So I love the integrity of getting really good at something and then teaching it and not mm. teaching it out of a book or teaching it because you know you're a teacher you know you, you gotta you gotta be a doer and then people want to learn from that I always want to learn from people that are yeah. successfully doing something was there anything piece of advice Bill gave you that was valuable oh probably so much but man I'm trying to remember um, oh, I, I, I remember it wasn't a piece of advice but I remember having lunch with Bill once and uh, we were having some kind of a discussion or whatever at the table, and he just looked over to me and goes, boy, you are competitive, aren't you? Why, like, why do you say that? 
uh, what it, first of all, I am. So he was just being perceptive. But whatever the conversation was, right. you know, he had at the time there there were like uh, ninety or so of these uh, GKIC advisors of us running chapters, like the one you came into when I was running one in Chicago and all over the country. And I wanted to be the top chapter, when, yeah. which I eventually had the largest chapter in the country. And uh, so it must have been some discussion about that and how, you know, I have a bigger chapter than this and I'm doing, and, you know, and he's like, you know, but he just looked at me and said, boy, you are really competitive, aren't you? And, uh, and, it, and it wasn't, it, it was a nod of approval saying that. At the same time, he was kind of un, un, unwritten behind the scenes. He was also kind of saying, check that a little bit. Hmm. Like, watch that. Like, yeah. I'm having a conversation with people and I can't even talk to, if you were running the chapter in, you know, Omaha, I can't even talk civilly with you. I'm like, you know, what are you doing, man? You got to do this and that and this. Let's get it going, whatever. Bill's like, boy, you are a competitive guy. Tone it down a little. So uh, he didn't have to really say that, but just that little thing. And mm. I appreciated the fact that uh, I also remember when Bill just asked me, you know, tell me about your story. Just like you just did here. Tell me about your story. What did you do before? I was like, wow. You know, guy has all these people, runs this big multi-million dollar business. Just, I'm one of his little chapter guys here. And and very soon after I met him, was running this chapter. It was probably soon after I was having some kind of success. He wanted to know about me a little bit. Right. And so I have used that uh, with you know that's one reason I had a lot of success in my chapter. I really cared about all my members. I really wanted to know all about them. And so yeah, it wasn't a lot of because uh, other than that, the advice from Bill was probably a lot of nuts and bolts. Probably a lot of like here's a strategy to do. Yeah. But getting having lunch with the person. And uh, getting to know Bill a little bit, that was the big joy. Getting yeah. to know Bill and his wife, Karen, and his daughter, Mara. And, uh, and that's, uh, that, to me, is the biggest part of it, is knowing these people as people. And getting that, to get that kind of access to people, you really got to perform, right? Yeah. If I was an underperforming chapter director or just another member of, the, of, the, of his organization of hundreds of members, or probably had a thousand members or whatever of the group, like, it's not like I'm going to have dinner with Bill and he's going to ask me and want to get to know me. Uh, and so I, I do that with my members and, 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 and people too and I, I just I like to want to get to know people and I think it's a compliment when somebody who is successful just wants to get to know you. So yeah. probably didn't answer your question exactly but uh, that was a big confidence booster that Bill wants to know a little bit about me and he yeah. kind of approves. He approves at the same time he's going to check that a little bit. Uh, that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Steve, this has been fantastic. Like last time, I really appreciate it. Thank That's you terrible. so much. That's terrible. That means you're going to want me to come back again. I, I would. Shave. I, I would actually. You know, I'm at home here. I don't normally dress like this. Really <laughs> shape. My wife's like, you have pajama bottoms on? They'll shave that. for Jeremy. <laughs> I, I actually do. Of course, I actually do. So. Yeah. I appreciate it, though. I, I would have you back every week, you know? It's... Shirt is not tucked in. The sweatpants I down. mean, there is still tons of questions. I'm not, I'm not going to um, have you back um, right away, but... I mean, I have written down R.H. Donnelly questions about selling yellow oh, page ads and yellow how you did that. And we didn't get to that. I mean, anytime it sir. goes on and on, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.